Okay, so for those of you who um, joined after I introduced myself, my name's Beth Breeze and I am the UK's first professor of philanthropic studies, um, but by no means the first to be studying philanthropy. There's um, lots of us who do, but they might be a professor of history or economics or uh, what have you. But I, this is what I've done throughout my academic career. Uh, and I'm really uh, delighted to be here to tell you about what we do at Kent and to uh, sort of give you some insights into the programme that we run to see if you've got a goal to get a master's degree uh, and if this might be right for you. So what I'm going to do is talk for, I don't know, about 10 or 15 minutes, just to run through um, the programme, how we teach it, what we cover and so on. And that leaves us plenty of time at the end for some questions. I'm very relaxed about people jumping in if you've got any questions as we go along, or you can pop them in the chat and Stefan, who you met a moment ago, will help me make sure that I don't miss any key ones. Um, and equally, you can ask some questions at the end. So I hope that all sounds like what you're expecting. Um, on this first slide, just to point out to you, we've got the um, the centre's website, so philanthropy at kentact.uk, and hopefully you've all, also got my email address uh, if you've got an email from me this morning or last night, depending on where you are in the in the world. Um, so you're very welcome to you know follow up. I know not everything gets covered in in one session, and sometimes you don't think of the question till afterwards. So you're absolutely welcome to to stay in touch with us. Okay, so let's let's uh, move on and tell you about the the masters. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of personal history, which is that I began my career working in the nonprofit sector. Um, I was a fundraiser um, and I did that for about 10 years and I absolutely loved it. Um, I worked in a youth homelessness charity to begin with and then later in education charities and think tanks. Um, but I had this feeling, and this may be familiar to you, that quite often I was making it up as I went along. I had lovely colleagues, they taught me all they could, but it wasn't any sort of structured learning. I couldn't find the literature or the research or, you know, the best practice put down in a book anywhere. So in many ways, this course comes from what I wish had existed uh, when I was uh, working in the sector. And it was not just wanting to know about, you know, the, the nuts and bolts of what I was doing, in, in my case, fundraising, but okay, somebody... sure. So we're just going to pop some mutes on there, if that's OK. Thank you. <laughs> oh, if it's you, if you don't mind muting, that'd be super. Um, so what I was saying was it's not really just the techniques of working in the sector. And you may be in different roles. You might be a grant maker, you might be a volunteer manager, you might be a charity sector leader. You might be wanting to join the charity sector. There are you know, plenty of courses out there that sort of teach you how to do it. Um, but what I wanted to do was something a bit more, which was, well, what's the sector all about? Like, why do we have a philanthropy sector? You know, what role does it have compared to, say, government and business? Um, you know, what's the history um, of the sector? What what can we learn from philosophers who think about, you know, the meaning of life and what a good society is? Um, what can we learn from economics, human geography, um, psychology about why people give and so on? So I wanted something that was really multidisciplinary and a bit broader, um, that, as I say, rather than just how to do it. Although our students do tell us that they, they feel they do get a bit better at raising money or managing and so on, but that's not the primary purpose. That's more a sort of a, a nice a nice side effect. So that was where the course came from. And as I say, after about 10 years of working in the sector, I came here to the University of Kent, where I stayed, stayed put since then. I did my PhD was on um, contemporary philanthropy. So I've always been focused on major donors. Um, but the course obviously covers people who work with all kinds of different donors and different kinds of charities. As it says on the slide, we're trying to make sure it's flexible. You know, we know that most of you do not want to give up your job for a year or two years to study. You need to keep going with your jobs. You need to, you know, lots of personal commitments and things you like to do. So we try and have a course that fits around your life and your work. So it's very flexible. We also try and make it very affordable. Um, we know that you know people have got debts from undergraduate degrees, um, and so we just do our best to keep it at a level which people working in the nonprofit sector can afford. Um, so I think it's eight and a half thousand for the whole degree spread over two years, which um, I worry sometimes it, it looks you know sometimes when things are cheaper you think they're not as good, but I promise you it's done for a reason. We want you to we want it to be accessible to you all. So that's um, probably enough to say about the course, or maybe just to say in terms of the flexibility you don't have to be anywhere at any particular time it's all taught online and i'll show you an example um, of the online learning environment later um, but it's not like there's a lecture at 12 o'clock or what have you we do do some optional 
uh, live webinars like this because it's really nice to see people and we all get to know each other quite well but you don't have to be anywhere at any particular time and people have done this course successfully from New Zealand and from Australia when they can barely join any live things but anyway we'll get into the course a bit later let me just first of all introduce the team because there's not just me uh, this is the top row is our permanent staff so Ali Body is the director of studies um, Emily Lau um, and Claire and Carl teach on different modules I'll uh, introduced to you in a moment uh, and then we have also associates and um, guest lecturers so including our associates are Rodri Davis who some of you I think will probably know from his philanthropy matters um, and his uh, philanthropism's podcast which is excellent I recommend it to you and Emma Beeston uh, on the other side is a philanthropy advisor who teaches the advising donors course so we draw on lots of uh, experts from within and outside of the university too and the um We've written a lot of the books, basically, that we teach and they get taught at other universities. So we have some readers, the philanthropy reader and the fundraising reader, which are really big, thick, nice books with all the key texts you need to, to know. And we send you a copy of the philanthropy reader if you join us. Uh, and there's some other examples of books on there that the team have written. So that's the team. Um, I also want to show you our campus because it's so beautiful. If you live in or near Canterbury, you are very welcome. If you join the course, you're a full student of the university. So you are perfectly uh, entitled to be here, to use the library, to, uh, you know, go theatre, cinema, all the usual things you have at a university. So some people do come and uh, work on their assignments here or work on their dissertation here. Um, and once a year, we have uh, an on-campus co uh, conference. So that's a good chance for people to get together. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. But as I said a moment ago, there's no obligation to come to campus or to, to be here if you can't. Some people go all the way to graduation and just turn up for the party at the end, which is fine by me. So that's our lovely campus. So the conference, every, once a year, it's usually the Friday after Easter, but this year Easter is crazy early. So it's Friday the 19th of April. Um, we have a full day get together for the current students. So people who are in year one and two, for people who've graduated and we've now got six graduated cohorts. So some of them are much further in their careers. Uh, our PhD students come, we run a fundraising apprenticeship, so they come. Um, and then also people who are thinking of joining the course, like yourselves, are very welcome as well. It's free. Um, and I think Stefan's going to put into the chat the link if you want to see some more information uh, and to register. Uh, as you can see, we've got some great speakers. And this is a good idea, of, uh, example of the kind of people who contribute to the course. So Fozia um, is a wonderful thinker. She's got a new book out called Transformative Philanthropy. And she works at BBC Children in Need, so a really experienced practitioner. Tom Steinberg was a grant maker and he's written a book with Gemma Bull uh, on modern grant making, how we can improve grant making. And Mark Phillips is a very experienced fundraising consultant who does lots of fun stuff online around the history of fundraising. So, you know, three great speakers this year. So if you, if you want to know a bit more about us, uh, then, then sign up and come along. You'll get to meet the, the teaching team in the flesh. And actually, quite importantly, you'll get to meet some current and recent students and I think it can be quite nice to get a, a student's perspective um, on what it's you know, what's it really like to do this course you know how do you fit it in around your work um, you know what's it like watching online lectures rather than real life lectures so uh, we can you know you can you can meet some of the students there and ask them how it goes if you're not able to come and you would like that uh, student to student chat or potential student to student chat drop us a line and um, we can uh, introduce you to somebody and it can be quite helpful and I'll say more at the end in next steps how you can do that but let's stay focused on the course because probably you're keen to know never mind where it is never mind who you meet what do you actually study so it's a set menu um, we don't have any options because we like to keep the group together. Um, we did in the past have options and people sort of missed each other and missed out on conversations. So it's a set menu. Everybody follows the same modules. So it begins um, with a module called Fundamentals of Philanthropy, and that starts at the end of September, which is when the uh, the autumn term starts. And as you can imagine, that's a real you know basics. How do we define philanthropy? Um, what's its history? How has it evolved? What are the key theories um, that influence our understanding of philanthropy. Uh, we focus quite a lot on the relationships between different kinds of philanthropists and beneficiaries. So that might be individuals, it might be corporations, foundations, and so on. And then we look at some of the critiques and the debates around uh, problems with philanthropy and um, how they might be improved. So we cover an awful lot in that first term. And the idea is by the end that everyone's feeling very confident that they know what this thing is that they're studying. And when your relatives say, what, what is it you're doing again? You can say, ah, let me tell you. So that's the goal for uh, term one. 
Then term two, which we're in now, the spring term. Um, so our first years are doing the art and science of fundraising. Um, and that's when we look at, um, so as I say, the theory, the history, the evolution of fundraising uh, in its professional uh, status since sort of the beginning of the 20th century. Um, we look at techniques and strategies, but we also look at ethical debates around, say, due diligence and relationships uh, between fundraisers and uh, and their colleagues and also the external environment. Um, it's so yeah, the, we, we cover an awful lot in that. The, give you a flavour. This week we had um, Philippa Charles from the Western Foundation came to join us on Tuesday for an hour to talk about what it's like to run a big grant making foundation and how they uh, how they work with fundraisers and and try and make it um, uh, more feasible for them to to get the money they need for their organisations. So that's fundraising. And then in the summer next year, we'll be focused on global philanthropy. And as the name suggests, we're trying to go wide and say, okay. Philanthropy is not just a UK or a US phenomenon by any means. And there's a wonderful, strong history of philanthropy in every society throughout history. It's encouraged by every major religion uh, and it varies uh, across the world as well in, in very interesting ways. So we look at it uh, in a regional and country perspective, but then we also zone in on some topics like, say, education and health and the environment uh, and the philanthropic responses to those topics around the world. So that's how the first year pans out. And then in year two, we start with advising donors, um, and that's very much on um, the the infrastructure of support that surrounds, especially people making larger or much more strategic uh, philanthropic uh, uh, giving decisions. So where's that come from? You know, what is who are these intermediaries? What do they do? Um, how do they work with donors? Uh, how do they work with specific types of donors, like families, like the next generation, and so on? Um, and what are the the tools they use, like the donor journey and uh, finding causes and monitoring evaluation, and so on? So it's quite a good way to consolidate knowledge about um, uh, sort of larger philanthropy. That's kind of the four substantive courses, and then we have a course again this time of year. The second years are looking at research methods. And the reason for that is we want you to have a really thorough grounding in research design before you do your dissertation in the summer. So don't worry if you've never done original research before. We don't assume any prior knowledge. Uh, we teach you about quantitative me methods and qualitative methods. So uh, whether you want to count things or you want to interview people, we'll, we'll be there to support you. Uh, and we help you build your own research proposal for your your summer project and then from may till august of the second year you're working on your dissertation and you have a one-on-one -on -one supervisor myself or one of the others i showed you on that screen from the top slide who work with you all through the summer to do your your research project and to write it up in a twelve thousand word uh, dissertation and that gets submitted by the 31st of august 2026 so there you go. Simple. <laughs> that's that's the, the overview. And feel free. I know it's a lot to take in so we can go through um, any questions you've got about the course. But that's hopefully gives you a flavour of what we do. I mentioned before that I'd show you what the uh, online learning environment looks like. It's called Moodle, which to me was an unusual word when I first heard it. And it's still a quite a funny, funny word. But Moodle is our online, online learning platform. And this is a, an example. It's the very first task in the very first module. And we, we lay it out all very simply. So task one, first watch this lecture. Um, and we'll always tell you um, how long it lasts. So you might think, oh, I've got a lunch break coming up, but have I got time to watch it? Oh, it's only 25 minutes. Yes, I can. Um, it might be 10 minutes, it might be, you know, we don't tend to do hour long ones. It's too long to look at a screen. So there might be more like two or three 20 minute ones in a week. So about an hour's worth of lectures each week. And then we say, OK, then please read the following. And we embed the link so you can read them online. You've got full access to the digital library. But as I say, we, we do send you a copy of the Philanthropy Reader so you can also work from a hard copy if you like. I know some people like to. I, I do. I'm, I'm a books person. Uh, we provide the slides. We provide the script. So really, everyone has different learning styles. So if you're the kind of person who wants to read what's being said, then you can do that as well. So that's what the learning environment looks like. We also have an online forum where people jump in and say, oh, I, I disagreed with that or I had this idea or this is my experience. And that's you know quite lively and fun and a really nice way to get to know uh, your, your fellow students. So that's all, all on the uh, online. OK, can't resist showing you some pictures from graduation. Um, we do know that for many people, you know, you're, you're going to enjoy the journey as well as the destination. But there is a destination, which is that we cheer you as you walk up the aisle of beautiful Canterbury Cathedral, where we're lucky enough to hold our graduations. 
Um, and everyone graduates. I should have mentioned earlier, sorry, you don't have to do the full MA. You can do the PG diploma, which is the five taught courses without doing the dissertation. Or you can do the PG certificate, which is any three of the courses, including fundamentals. And if you get any of those three, you're, you come to graduation. If you do a standalone, just one module, that's fine as well. But you don't graduate with that. You have to get do three to get the certificate. And yep, here's some pictures. Um, Emily and myself are there on the left and standing uh, either side of Stephen, who was our 100th graduate. So this is a fairly established programme now. The 200th graduate should graduate the summer when you'd be working on your dissertation. So you're, you're joining a, you know, a growing community of people who are taking philanthropy seriously and studying it. And as you can see, it's very joyful. Lots of hats flipped in the air. I do enjoy that picture. <laughs> OK, um, I wanted to... Uh, introduce you to uh, some of our students who they're also their profiles are online and you can read their full statement about you know their reflection on the course but um Adele David and Serena very kindly let us share um share their, their pictures and their stories just to give you a flavor of you know what kind of people join this course so Adele works at um, an Oxford University Development College uh, so she was working in an academic environment um and is now applying to do a PhD with us actually she graduated last summer uh, Dave is in uh, North America, as he says. Uh, we always try and work around the time zones. Uh, and I love the fact that he mentions the student learning and advisory service. And I know that many of you have probably not studied for a while. You'll be thinking, how do you do referencing again? Um, how do you do note taking? How do you write an essay? All of that. We are very familiar with the fact that people have not done this for a while or perhaps your first degree was in physics and you've never written an essay at a university level occasionally we have people who don't have a first degree um for whatever reason life didn't uh, pan out that way when they were 18 or younger but they've gone on to have a really successful professional career they're now you know holding a senior job in the charity sector and they're going to do a master's uh, straight off without the first degree in that case the application would ask you to share some written work if you've got a first degree then we you know we know you, you can do that but we would ask for a little bit of extra from those people but I particularly love having them on the course and the fact that they've never graduated before and they get to do it with us and their families cheer very loudly so you can do that as well but the student learning advisory service is really helpful for everybody uh, if you're a bit out of uh, touch with uh, education skills or have never developed them uh, and then Serena is is uh, uh, another university-based uh, fundraiser, a couple on here. Uh, and yeah, just really nice that she mentions about meeting so many different people. It's quite a sociable group. There's a WhatsApp group, and I think meet, people meet up for drinks in London. I get terrible FOMO. We're not invited, of course, but, you know, that's fine. They want to talk about the course. So that's an example of some of the students. Um, coming towards an end now, so just to say, um, get, have your questions ready. Um, if you're not sure yet if this is for you, that's completely fair enough. Um, one of the things we've done to try and help people work out whether this would suit them um, is we've created an MA in a day. I like a bit of uh, rhyme. <laughs> so um, what we've done is put on some kind of um, free lectures um, and some access to resources, just so you can get a flavour of the kind of thing that will be covered. And um, that's the link there. And there's five topics which pretty much reflects what we teach in the course and it's just we actually developed it during covid for people who weren't even planning to come to study with us we just wanted to give something back to the sector and say you know you're at home can't really get any professional training done so have some access to our courses but it's quite nice and people seem to enjoy it okay so next steps um, apart from the fact that we're going to chat now for a little while if you want to uh, if you've heard what you want to hear feel free to 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 move off to what you need to do but um i'll, I'll be staying around uh, for questions if you've got any questions afterwards, you can either email myself, you've got my email from this morning, Ali Body, who's our director of studies, um, or philanthropy at kentdark.uk. As I say, join us next month if you want to come and check us out in person. Um, that's the link for applying. And I think um, Stefan's going to share the, the web page with the apply now button. There's no huge rush. Um, obviously, we, the next cohort starts in September, but sometimes it's nice just to get it in. It can take a while to get references and just go through the process. So please don't leave it to the last minute if you are planning to join us and certainly no later than the end of July because August is all about undergraduates and clearing and so on. Um, on references, please don't worry if you've been out of university for so long or whenever at university and you don't have two academics you can name we do you know that's very common on our course it's fine to have practice-based references so perhaps someone um quite senior in your organization or a trustee member or somebody who can speak to your ability to be you know organized to see things through uh maybe your ability to write and project manage and so on but any worries just just ask us and the best thing to do really is get the application in if and if the referee that's suggested isn't right they'll come back to you and 
ask you. Everything is done by people, not computers. So the, the person in the admissions office would come to you and say, hey, Johnny, you know, we need a different referee in. So don't hold off from submitting because you can't find them. Just get it in and we'll, we'll work it out later. Right, there you go. That's all the things I want to say. I'm going to stop sharing so I can see all your faces. I hope that was okay. That was a little bit longer than 50 minutes. Sorry about that. I get very enthusiastic. Um, but um, <laughs> let, let me now just open the floor to you. Oh, my colleague Carl is here. I don't Carl, if you want to give people a wave. Uh, I mentioned Carl earlier. He teaches the research methods course and is a very experienced uh, nonprofit professional. So delighted to have him on the team. Hi, okay. everyone. <laughs> that cheers, Carl. So Juliana has uh, sent us a question. Can you share examples of how philanthropists get involved in the modules? Yes, we did have. So in the fundamentals of philanthropy module, um, we are very lucky that a gentleman called David Gold joins us. He's a philanthropist. Um, he actually features on page one of my book, In Defense of Philanthropy. I've known him for many years. And he's a, a he's a quite a charismatic. I mean, you know, he he thinks a lot about what what he gives and and how and why. So David joins us uh, in about November, so halfway through the first term, and people seem to really enjoy that experience to talk directly to uh, a philanthropist. Um, probably there's others who pop up in the year, but that's the one that comes to mind. And by the way, you feel free to do a thing and, and talk. I don't need to just. Uh, we, we like to hear from you as well. Um, Florina, oh, exam. No, there are no exams. It's all based on assignments. So thank you for, for asking about that and sorry for not mentioning it um, unprompted. So each term has usually two assignments. It might be a book review, it might be an essay. Uh, we try not to be too repetitive with essays because you know the ability to write an essay is a lovely thing, but it's not the only thing. So I'm currently marking the first assignment on the um, art and science of fundraising module. And in that, we asked everyone to give us. 500 words each on four different key concepts so that might be the donor pyramid um the gift uh no actually we don't have gift table this year the culture of philanthropy relationship fundraising mission drift so we've got a whole long list of things and people choose any four they like and they write 500 words where they define it discuss it give examples and so on and that seems a nicer you know way of just working rather than just asking for a long essay on relationship fundraising so it's all assignments florina thanks for asking that um Kirsten do you want to ask your question or do you want me to read it out oh it's the same one isn't it about assessment sorry it's the same one so um just to add to that just checking if any of the assignments are group work or if it's, it's everything individual it's all individual uh, again because of the time zone thing maybe also because when I was a student I didn't I would never like group work but I know that's a purely purely personal preference and some people love it um, so no, it's it's all individual. So you've got your written assignments and there is another bit. So Kirsten, I'm glad you prompted again. So um, for each um, term, 40% on one assignment, 40% on the other. And the final 20% is participation on the online forum. So as I say, we have this every week, we um, have this space. If you've joined a, a thread on a online discussion board before, you'll, you'll be very familiar with it. So somebody starts off saying, oh, um, you know, I read all the texts on definitions of philanthropy and the one I liked best was philanthropy is the history of kindness. And here's why I think that. And then someone else says, oh, no, I disagree. I think it's better to define it as, you know, this other thing. And so and then someone else wants to start another thread in the same week and they want to talk about something else. So in each week, there might be 10 threads going and we don't expect everyone to read them all. That's our job. But you can join in with the ones you want to. And all we ask is that over the term, you do at least three posts. So three substantive posts where you say something substantive not just nice point johnny but you know here's what i think and ideally maybe referencing to a it's not a mini essay it's it's informal but you don't just say oh i heard somebody said this you want to say this person said it and who's who they are so that's how it works and um yeah and it's quite nice because some people um you know are better at you know different things and i think we, we're trying to make sure that everybody has a chance to shine so the online forum is often a place where people you know get maybe a higher mark and it helps to boost their overall and i should say that we you know we do tend to recruit people who are pretty committed pretty serious about this so nearly everybody gets a merit or a distinction um on a normal course you'd expect to have you know fails passes merits distinctions in that but people don't give their time and effort and money to join a course that they're not going to take seriously and fail or, or or have you so it's we tend to have mostly merits and, and a good sprinkling of distinction so that's nice uh, janine do you want to ask your question sure hi everyone um just wondering about corporate social responsibility practices and if that is an aspect of the course yeah thanks very much so um I mentioned that in the first course, we in the first term, we look at different kinds of philanthropists and their relationships with um, um, 
I said with beneficiaries, but actually with any stakeholders. So that's when corporate philanthropy first appears. So we have a week in uh, in the first term and we look. So I've done some research on employees and how they get involved in corporate philanthropy. Um, but then what you find is the course is quite cumulative. So it's not like you finish fundamentals of philanthropy, close the book and never think about it again. Actually, we we go back to threads from earlier. We build on ideas and theories and authors so people carry on citing things they've read in the earlier modules so corporate philanthropy would come up again in fundraising you know how do you fundraise how do you get you know what what is the charity of the year model and you know how does that work how do you um how do you make the most of those kind of partnerships uh, in advising donors it might come in again because a lot of people who seek philanthropy advice actually have a family business or maybe are quite senior in a business so yeah it comes across and then somebody might want to do their dissertation on corporate philanthropy so What's quite nice is when people sort of carve out a pathway that that's their interest and then all the way through their assignments, you can see them focusing on it. So and it's not always a topic like that. We had one uh, student in the, in the second cohort who's really interested in history. So whatever the topic was, she would pick the history question and she ended up doing a dissertation on Victorian female philanthropists and the connections between them, how they actually knew each other. They were quite networked, you know, letters and so on. So you can carve out a path for yourself. Other people don't want to do that. They want to study loads of different things. So one term they'll write the history essay, another term they'll write a maybe more philosophical one, another time they'll focus on something else. So it's really up to you. And, um, and we, we want to encourage you to get what you need out of the course. OK, um, James, J, J Andrew, James, do you want to ask your question? <laughs> Uh, yes, yeah, sure. Happy to do so. I posted um, my first question are, can you share key sectors of philanthropy that are used in case-based learning in the program? Um, for example, do we have any dialogues or investigations um, on cross-movement and cross-sector philanthropic practice, as an example? Oh, Carl, if you want to jump in here uh, and help me, because I'm not sure I've totally understood the question. Um, so... Go on, yeah. So, James, it, it seems to me that actually we are more likely to try and do cross sector sort of philanthropy. So linking this to one of the other questions about do we look at emerging or promising practice rather than just existing practice? So the emergence of trust based philanthropy would be an example of, of emerging practice that we look at. Uh, and indeed, Beth and I are currently employing uh, in a piece of uh, in a new piece of research called Moonshot Philanthropy, where we are trying to think about uh, philanthropists that take big bets, and then that feeds into ultimately the teaching uh, uh, that we do in our approach. So, uh, at the risk of sort of giving you the answer that maybe the wrong answer, we don't focus so much on specific subsectors. We're thinking more about how philanthropy is a cross-cutting or what my policy colleagues would call a horizontal issue rather mm -hmm. than thinking about philanthropy as a vertical issue. Um, in as much as we would think about philanthropy as a sort of a, a, a subsector or, or how it pertains to subsectors, I think we're probably getting close to that when we might be thinking about topics such as crowding out or the, the relationship between philanthropy and the state, where it seems to me that that, that tends to focus around specific subsectors. Is that all right, Beth? Oh, more than all right. It, it depends if it's all right with James. <laughs> Everything's good on that end. Um good. And you asked another one as well. So you're asking about ethical and risk considerations. I mean, ethics is another of those like golden thread topics. I mean, you can't study yeah. philanthropy without thinking about it. There's so many manifestations of it. So the, the area I've written on is probably most in fundraising. So the relationship, the power difference between the fundraiser and the, the, the potential donor is obviously large. So thinking about how that plays out in terms of gender, age and, and so on. So, yeah, I would say that's another golden thread and definitely a good dissertation topic because there's so much more to be done and you know here's a chance to make a broader point you know philanthropic studies is not like geography or history or you know English where there's you know people have been studying it for decades and a lot has been said this is a field where there's it's very open it's quite embryonic I mean it's been studied seriously in the US you know for longer but really in in Europe and the rest of the world it's 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 only the last 10 20 years um so there's there's a lot of potential to even as a master's student to do a, a dissertation project that actually contributes something meaningful um to 
our general, you know, our collective knowledge about a topic. So every year we invite the people who've done particularly well in their dissertation to work with us to turn it into a journal article and get it published. And then they become part of the materials that we use to teach in the future. And that's a, a particular um, sort of happiness for me when I when I see that uh, occur. And some people join the course to go on to do a PhD. They might not have thought it at this point when they were just thinking about it. Some come planning to do a PhD, but it's a very good grounding because you've obviously read you know a lot if not everything um so yeah so we are really contributing to knowledge and i would say um yeah these ethics is one of those areas that, that does need it anna you definitely winning the the cat prize i mean that's a great cat but i can't answer your question i'm sorry um i don't know i'm probably one of our current us students would know so if you don't find an easy way to get the answer i can put you in touch with dave or someone else um or someone in the the university uh, office would be able to help but i'm sorry I, I don't know that side of things i'm afraid Okay. Um, anybody want to chip in and without, you don't have to type it first. You can just ask your, your question without typing if you like. I had a question. I was I started hey. typing, but I thought I would just speak. Um, <laughs> thank you so much. What a lovely presentation as well. Thanks, Beth. Oh. Um, I, my question was about uh, the uh, the PG dip and PG cert yeah. one. So how does it work? Like, do you pick, can you pick what bits you do or do you get, do you have to do certain certain parts of it yeah so the pg dip because we don't have a uh, options it's the five courses so you do there's no no choices needed you just take the five um and people with the research methods um course and carl teaches this so you might want to add some more i described it very much as a precursor to the dissertation but actually it does stand on its own merits because we all absorb research all the time perhaps in your job you commission research or you're reading it and using it so to spend 12 weeks thinking about is this good quality data is it robust um you know what's the sources um is still a useful exercise even if at the end of it you're not then going on to do a dissertation so that's a pg dip the PG cert, um, everyone does fundamentals of philanthropy and then any other two that you want to do. So each module um, counts for 20 credits and you need 60 credits to get the PG cert, uh, 120 credits to get the PG dip and 180 for the for the MA because the dissertation counts for 60. Um, I should say as well, there's a lot of movement up and down. So some people join to do the PG cert, enjoy it and then decide to move up to do the whole MA. Um, occasionally, it's, that's the most common direction, people moving up. So we take that as a compliment that people, you know, start off with a toe dipping and then decide to stay. But it is the case that some people start to do the MA and then life gets in the way, you know. Um, things happen, you change job, you move house, people get ill, you know, things happen. Yeah. So then they move down from the MA to the PG cert or the PG dip. And it's a, it's a one, one sheet of paper form, change of course form. You just say you want to change. We always support you and it goes through. It's not a problem. The only thing to make sure you do it before the end of the course, because you can't graduate at the cathedral with the PG cert and then say, oh, actually, I'd like to upgrade to the MA. You can't graduate twice with the same credits. So we just make sure that you've, you know, say by Easter in the first year, if you're going to want to stay on, just do that bit of paperwork then. Um, does that help, Leah? Perfect. Lovely. Anyone else got any other? Oh, Catherine's got one in the, the chats. Um, how do you pay for the course? It's, it's per year. So again, forgive me, I'm not hugely upon this. I do know that you can do it by the month. And I think we asked for that near the beginning, because again, we're just very aware that nonprofit salaries do not lend themselves to having huge sums of money sitting in the bank. So I believe you can pay by the month, which if you divide eight and a half thousand by 24 it's it's like a very expensive gym membership is how i heard someone describe it once and I, i'll go with that you know um so that's that's how that works um and yeah it's uh, i mean i guess if you wanted to do it all up front if you for some reason that suits you do that i'm sure they wouldn't turn you down but you certainly don't have to um oh anna no i didn't mention how many in the cohort usually about 25 um the highest we had is 30 i think that was post covid when people were just bursting to do things um but yeah it's usually somewhere around about 25 which is a nice number because actually i think that's about what we've got on today's call so you get the sense that it's perfectly doable you can show your um uh, you show your face if you want to and chat uh, people do get to know each other pretty well um you know some of my colleagues when we first started teaching this said gosh, you know, don't you miss being in a lecture hall with people? And I said, but when you're in a lecture hall, someone might slope in at the back, you know, the baseball hat on, head down and then slope out again the minute it ends. And I never get to speak to them or know them. When we teach like this, we really do um, get to know people. And if someone doesn't turn up to the live events very often or just wants an extra chat or help, it would be a one-on-one -on -one chat on screen. So we know everything about you. We know, we, we know what 
colour your walls are painted, we know what your pets are like. The only thing we don't know is how tall you are. So when, when we finally see people at graduation or on the campus conference, I'm quite tall and people are always surprised. Um, and so that's the only, the only thing we don't know. But other than that, we do get to know people pretty well. Um, we try as well, um, just to add to that, Anna, to encourage cross-cohort conversations because it may be that somebody who's in the first year now would be someone would be really useful for you to talk to so especially if you're in a country where you know you're the only one from there so I I would introduce the New Zealanders to each other I would I would introduce people who are working in the same field and just you know in a natural way when it seems appropriate but that can be quite nice too and and Beth could I yeah, could please. I sort of just add to that I know we're calling them a cohort but at the risk of sounding a bit cliched I, I it very much feels like it's a community uh, it's a group of people who, uh, well, first of all, there's a WhatsApp group, which we don't get to see. So, of course, I'm terrified constantly that you're all saying things about <laughs> me, uh, about how rubbish my lectures are. Uh, uh, but quite seriously, it's a community where, uh, for example, with the online forums, where you're supporting each other, where you are uh, at the risk of sort of like getting a bit techie now, but like, were you co-producing the knowledge with us, where you were sharing your insights uh, uh, with each other where you're feeding back to each other on on sort of your ideas and sort of what's going on so even though you might worry that because it's distance learning and we're all at the other end of a screen that it's a lonely experience I, I don't think it is 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 my sense of it yeah no thanks for saying that Carl I think that's that's really true the other thing I'd say though is that there's definitely a spectrum of some people who are really engaged you know, they're the ones organizing the London meetups or the New York meetups they're on the WhatsApp a lot and so on there's other people who that's just not what they're here for um either they've just got a lot going on in life or there's just not that kind of person and we don't hear a lot from them um obviously as tutors we drop them a note if we don't see them on the online forum because we want to make sure they, they post three times so that they, they pass the element but there's no forced uh, involvement um, and I would say there's some people who've graduated and and I have I've marked their assignments so I know their work but I haven't really got to know them as a person because they've chosen not to engage and that's that's fine too I'd say there's a couple like that every year that's fine too we're all different um, Stephanie no post three times per module so that's the, the minimum uh, and we do have criteria again we like to be quite clear so we've got marking rubrics so you can see and it will say you know hit to, to perform well on the uh, online forum, to get a bare pass, you need to post three times, say something you know relevant and do the, to get a merit, you need to do this, to get a distinction, you need to do that. So distinctions might be posting maybe more than half the times. So it's, there's a quantity element a bit, but equally someone can write three amazing posts and get a merit or someone could post every week, but not really ever say much and get a pass. So it's not just quantity. So we do have, you know, we like to be clear in all of that. Um, Leah. Oh, that's a very good question. So Leah's asking about how many hours each week does it take? And there is a, there's a, an official answer and an unofficial answer. So I'll give you the official answer, which is that each module, I think a credit counts for 10 hours of study. So a 20 credit module will be 200 hours of study. And I think that's fairly common at any university. So, but of course, in reality, um, you may, when you're working on an assignment, that might be you know, a weekend, just head down, getting it done. Then you might, the following week, have you handed in your assignment, you've got a busy week at work or something else going on, you might just come onto the learning platform Moodle and just watch the lectures, which, as I say, would be about 50 minutes to an hour. Um, and that's all you do, maybe have a quick skim of the reading. Or you've gone on holiday for the week, so you don't do anything that week, but the following week, because it's asynchronous, which means it's all online, you can catch up with last week's because you can they're still there, which is one of the advantages, of course, if you do it online if it's in the classroom you miss it you've missed it um but you can you can catch up again if we we can see when you've been online we don't know exactly what you're doing we, we don't know what you're reading or watching but we can see if you've logged on to moodle and if someone's not logged on for over a week i'd probably drop them a note and say are you okay can i help and they'd say oh i've been on holiday or, i've been very busy at work and i'm going to catch up now so yeah the the answer is it can be as little as you know an hour or so watching the lectures and uh, having a quick look at the reading or it could be many hours if you're doing an assignment or if you're really interested in the topic um, and going back to that point I was saying before about you know people have different interests we also know people have different levels of enthusiasm so you might really want to know everything about corporate philanthropy but have fairly minimal interest in studying I know philanthropy in, in Russia or Scandinavia or something and you're just going to read the basics but you're not going to do any extra reading so on that sheet I showed you with the um what the course looks like you've got the lectures you've got the reading but then at the bottom of that there's further reading and further resources so you can dive in and really you know 
do a lot more or you can say that's not for me most people probably wait till they're doing their assignment and then go back and look at the extra reading on that topic so uh when it comes to research methods i won't be remotely offended if you tell me you have no interest at all in quantitative methods or anything to do with sort of stats and indeed what i find with my module is that people have a pretty good idea of, of what they're interested in in terms of a topic and then they'll tune into what are the methods what's the way that they want to go about asking that question and they'll probably focus just on those methods and and just sort of like dip in and out a bit of the other module of the rest of the module and um, the other thing i was going to say is that um beth i don't know what your guess is here but i reckon at least three quarters of our current students have a job that they are doing alongside this it, it might even be more uh, well i think it's 95 percent, 90 yeah, exactly. it's, it's yeah. People. yeah 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 um and you know i mean as, as my sense from sort of doing this a few, few years now is that people find a way um it will be tricky sometimes you know i mean let's not get around that you know i mean we've you know you're all doing jobs and you know that there are going to be periods where it's busy at work and it can be a struggle managing everything but i think these things sort of even out over the course um of the module and, and indeed the, the MA as a whole. Yeah, I think that's fair. And I think that's one of the things it's good to talk to other students about, like what, what's it actually like? How does it work? You know, um, I'll just go to Kirsten's question and then I'll, I'll maybe say something more on that. We'll see. Kirsten. So if you wanted to finish mine's completely off topic. So, oh, okay. Well, all yeah. I was going to say mm -hmm. was that, um, you know, we, we, so we've all studied, a, I, I did my master's when I was in a job. So I was working in London. I went to the LSE. It was a sit down lecture thing, but I was still kind of running between work and, and study. And I know that sometimes I just did good enough. One of my mottos is good enough is good enough. Uh, you know, it wasn't a topic I was, you know, either passionate about or I just didn't have the time. So I submitted work that would pass and that was fine. Other times I had more time, more enthusiasm and I did a lot. So I know that that's how our students are as well. So if you're really busy at work and you just want to pass, you know, we understand that you may not put your heart and soul into it and other times you might. So we, we don't get confused when sometimes the quality changes. We just know that's life and people are getting on with things. So, yeah, I just wanted to share that with you, that there's quite a lot of pragmatic um, approach and understanding on both sides. Kirsten. Um, thanks so much, Beth. And yeah, thank you so much for hosting this afternoon. It's been really helpful to learn more about the course. So thank you for your time. Um, I just wanted to check, is it, uh, do you, does the um, centre offer research masters? And if so, how can I find out about that? And then um, a second question separate to that is, is there a relationship between your centre at the University of Kent and the Strategic Centre for Philanthropy at Cambridge? Yeah, so we all know each other. So to start with that one, because I was with Claire Woodcraft just last week, actually, who is, used to be the director, is now the fellow there. So there's not that many of us studying philanthropy, as, as I mentioned earlier. So we, you know, wouldn't couldn't quite fit in my office here, but almost. We also know the colleagues who are in America, so at the Indiana Lilly Family School of Philanthropy. So um, I would guest lecture on Michael Moody and Pamela Vietkin's courses, and they come and guest lecture here. So you do get to be taught by some of those people if we know them uh, and we have those kind of quid pro quo reciprocity arrangements set up. So yeah, it's a small world, the world of philanthropy scholarship, and which again is why it's quite nice to join um, because you can know most people and read what most people are. I, I feel quite overwhelmed at the thought of doing a subject that's been going forever. One of my good friends is a Sylvia Plath scholar in English. And I think, my goodness, there must be so so many of you and so much to read. And, you know, it's, it just feels very large. So nice to nice to have a, a smaller pond to swim in. Um, so that's that's that bit of it. Recent with the school, the university offers research masters, but not specifically in philanthropy. So you could do a research masters and pick a philanthropy topic, but it's not something that we particularly um you know, sort of encourage or talk about, but yeah, that, that option's there. I would probably question whether it would be an added benefit because what we're doing here is we're teaching you lots of, sort of very structured kind of learning around the literature and the ideas and then the dissertation. I know it's a bit shorter than a full research master's would be, but you've kind of had all the reading and the support to get there rather than doing it on your own, which is essentially uh, what, what happens. And that's why I encourage, and I think some of you on this call I've spoken to who, who are thinking of a PhD, um, and I do really encourage you to do at least the PG cert, because then you have a year of just really getting on top of the literature, develop your proposal, and then the PhD, which is kind of on your own, you know, you're, you're left to it once a month, you have a supervision with us, but it's the same kind of fees. I mean, the PhD is four and a half a year and the master's is four and a bit a year. So you might as well get your money's worth and get lots of extra support and help. You can just not 
submit the assignments if you don't want to but um it's nice to have an extra bit of paper and an extra graduation so I do think just having that because it's quite a new field it's it does make sense to me to do some talk courses before doing um uh, a big research project but we can Kirsten if you want to have a chat separately if you've got a specific idea in mind I'd be very happy to to do that you know offline after this great all right I'm not sure if I've missed any Stefan have I missed anything else in the uh in the chat because we're coming to the last five minutes now I don't want people to be we, we always try and finish at five to the hour so people can stretch their legs and get a cup of tea I, and stuff. no I think we covered everything unless anyone uh, has any new questions or Oh, so Janine did ask about dates. So yeah, the specific dates are um, universities probably got their dates set in on, online until about 2030. I don't know if you can find that link, Stefan, that gives the university term dates and pop it in the chat. But I know from the top of my head that we start, I think September the 26th is the Monday of um, of, of that uh, next, uh, next year, I think. Um, we tend to have a welcome week, the week before, week zero, we call it on each module so we just open the week the module you can start to look at the module handbook the cortex there's usually a, uh, an introduction video because you might not have met say claire yet and claire works with me on the fundraising module so in week zero we sort of lay the groundwork so then week one we can get straight into the history of fundraising for example so it's yeah it's september to december january to april may to july is uh is, is the three terms but hopefully yeah there you go thanks very much there the, the course dates shared by Stefan there. All right, thank you so much for sticking with us. I don't think anyone jumped ship, so that's that's always nice. Um, I'm really happy to have met you, to see you, to hear what's outside your window, so th thanks for that. Um, now you know us, drop us a line if you've got any questions. Um, we only want you know you to come if this is right for you, so ask as many questions as you want to ask if you want to meet a current student. Um, sometimes it can be nice to meet a current student, not just who lives near you, but maybe is in the same position as you. So if you're a new mum or you've got elderly parents or you're training for marathons and you want to meet somebody who's you know, juggling study work and that sort of life stuff, I'm very happy to try and think, oh, who might you know be similar to them or if you're working in a particular setting university's health or what have you just tell me what kind of person you want to meet and I'll do that thank you for all the thank yous that's so nice and um take care of yourselves and keep in touch and we'll maybe see you in April or September take care everyone bye 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 everyone thank you everyone bye. thank you so much bye